Chapter 15 Jazz ushered G. William into the house. Grandma peeked around the grandfather clock, saw it was the sheriff, and pointed her shotgun, trembling. G. William forced a grin and said, How do, ma'am? Didn't know there was a lady present. Apologies. Then he doffed his hat. Grandma giggled and scampered off to her bedroom. G. William arched an eyebrow. She's getting worse, Jazz. What? Nah. She's pretty stable these days. She's just off kilter because it's late, is all. G. William grunted. The sheriff had come here many, many times after arresting Billy, so Jazz didn't have to show him the way to the kitchen. Jazz groaned when he saw the scattered remnants of Grandma's meal. He swept the remains into the greasy bucket and dumped it in the sink. Coffee? he asked as G. William settled into a chair. Got enough in me to float in an armada, Jazz. Thanks, no, he sighed. I am not happy about this. Jazz felt great. He'd been right. Fiona Goodling hadn't been a one-off. Someone was out there prospecting. Someone was prospecting, and Jazz had seen it, had known it, before anyone else. Tanner sort of reminded Jazz of Reverend Paris from the Crucible, so eager to do something to help the town, but completely unwilling to believe that true evil was afoot. At first. Eventually, he came around. He had to. Linkage blindness was common in law enforcement. But in G. Williams' case, it came with a dose of wishful thinking. At the time dear old dad had violated his own cardinal rule and decided to prospect on Lobo's nod, G. William Tanner was a broken man. His wife of 37 years had just died after a year-long bout with the strain of ovarian cancer so cruel and so lingering that Billy himself would have admired it. In the next election, Tanner was all but guaranteed to lose to a young upstart from Calverton who had run on a thinly disguised platform of ageism, his slogan running along the lines of sweep in the new. Basically, with his wife dead and his lifelong career almost in the grave as well, G. William had nothing better to do than obsess over Kara Swinton, a blonde cheerleader from Lobo's Nod High School who'd gone missing. Some strands of her hair and a torn patch of her sweater found in a bush outside the post office. Everyone, even Kara's parents, thought she'd run off to New York. Kara dreamed of being a model. But G. William felt something different in there. And when Samantha Reed, another pretty young blonde, turned up dead in a culvert a week later, G. William knew he had something. He tied the murders to two of Billy's other crimes, committed ten years apart and in ways that Billy had been sure could never be connected. G. William Tanner, though, made the connections and came to realize that the artist, Green Jack, and others were all the same man, a man now operating in Lobo's nod. Widower, almost voted out of office, combined with the stresses of his personal life, the tracking of Billy Dent nearly destroyed G. William. Jazz understood why the sheriff desperately did not want to have to chase another serial killer. I've been trying to call you all night, G. William said. Couldn't get through. Pretty much decided not to bother, but I couldn't sleep. Realized I needed to tell you that you were right. If Jazz had been waiting for an apology, he would have waited a long time. One wouldn't be coming. As far as G. William was concerned, Jazz violating the crime scene made them even as far as not trusting each other went. Jazz slid into a chair across from the sheriff. So tell me what happened. A shrug. All started when we turned up a recent case with the same finger removal, M.O. It's not his M.O., Jazz said. It's his signature. He bit his lip immediately, and too late. G. William didn't need to be schooled right now. But the sheriff just nodded wearily. Right, right, I know, he said without reproach. Anyhow, body turned up three days ago, up in Lindenburg, just across the state line. Two fingers removed one of them left behind, the middle finger. Just two fingers. He only took one. Are you sure? We pretty much have the whole count to tending down pat, Jazz. Do they have an ID? Was she connected to Goodling at all? No. Not so as we can tell, at least. Names G. William heaved his bulk to one side and slid his smartphone out of his hip pocket. He scrolled through a screen. Names Carla O'Donnelly. 
college student from State U, no connection to Goodling that we can tell. G. William replaced the phone and passed a hand over his face, as though he could work some sort of magic trick and, ta-da, change the world before his eyes. The trick didn't work. I don't know if I'm up to this jazz, he said, his voice cracking with emotion. I'm just... His fingers trembled as he massaged his temples. Just felt like he just walked in on someone having sex. Awkward and embarrassed for G. William and ashamed of himself all at once. And maybe a little confused. Still, he couldn't help watching, observing. Some cold and clinical part of him, maybe the same part that made him such a fit for Reverend Hale, filed away G. William's reactions, his motions, his words. This is what it's like to be completely overwhelmed, he thought. This is what it's like to be at the end of your rope. Hale's words were fitting here. No man may longer doubt the powers of the dark are gathered in monstrous attack upon this village. Hale? Acting? What if it was all an act? The visit at night? The almost breakdown? Jazz didn't want to think it, but he had to. It would be irresponsible not to think it. What if the killer was none other than G. William Tanner? Everyone said that pursuing Billy had almost driven, driven the sheriff crazy. So what if that almost wasn't part of the equation? What if G. William had gone completely off his rocker and now had become the thing he hunted? Was that possible? No. No. Jazz wouldn't let himself believe it. Not everyone has a killer inside. Not everyone is like me. The sheriff honked loudly and steepled his fingers on the table in front of him. Anyway, she wasn't strangled to death like Goodling. She was smothered. Probably with a plastic bag, according to the report we got from Lindbergh. They emailed the whole thing, but I haven't gone through all of it yet. We don't know why he changed the number of fingers. We don't... He's counting, Jazz interrupted. It came to him like the original flash of insight that told him a serial killer had prospected Fiona Goodling. Back when he only knew her as Jane Doe. He's counting his victims. Goodling was his second. O'Donnelly was his first. He takes one finger for each victim to count. Leaves one behind to flip us off. That's his signature. Yeah, probably. That makes sense. Here is all the invisible world. Jazz leaned forward. You need me on this, G. William. I can help you. Let me see the report, both of them. Goodling and O'Donnelly. I was right from the beginning, and I can help. For a moment, Jazz thought that G. William would finally relent, but the moment passed. A head shake, vigorous and implacable. No, not a chance. For one thing, you get involved and world w word would leak out. And then I'll have the press all over it, and that's the last thing I need right now. Especially that jackass Doug Weathers. He'll try to ride this thing to fame and fortune just like he tried to ride your daddy. But, no. I'm not letting you get dragged into this nonsense. Like I said the other day, your job is to try to be normal. Your job is to be a kid, then grow up, then have a decent life. You've seen enough already. So have you. The sheriff smiled a tight, grim smile. Difference between you and me, kid? I get paid for this. Jazz shrugged. Okay, you talked me into it. I'll even give you a break on my salary. Chi William Gaffal slapping the table with one heavy palm. Nice try, Jazz. Nice try. I think I've abused your grandma's hospitality enough for one night, though. Sorry I got her all head up. Jazz walked him to the front door. I wouldn't know what to do with myself if, if there was a nice, calm, quiet night around here. G. William snorted something noncommittal and empathetic as he opened the door. He jammed his hat on his head. Rest easy, Jazz, and hey, good call was the closest thing to an apology Jazz would get, he knew. You know there will be more, right? Jazz said, told him. He's counting up, not down. G. William said nothing. He just nodded once, and when we, he walked out the door, Jazz thought he'd just seen a dead man go out into the night. And a dream? And a knife? One, two. There was always a knife in the sink. And now in his hand, something new, and a voice, Billy's voice, and a hand, my hand, a hand on the knife. Easy, so easy, it's just like cutting chicken.
And another voice says, one, two, it's okay. It's okay. I want a line of blood bubbles where the knife slices. Good boy. Good boy. One cut. Two cuts. Just like that. Just like one, two. For the second time that night, Jazz awoke suddenly. This time, though, it had nothing to do with anyone pounding on his door. All was silent, save for the occasional snore from Grandma through the wall. Jazz sat upright, shifting from dead sleep to fully awake in a split second, his mind buzzing and sparking. Somehow, in his sleep, he'd made the connection. It was about the counting, the fingers, he knew. Was it even possible? He flipped on the light and went online searching for information about Fiona Goodling. In an irony that Jazz enjoyed for a brief moment, he noticed that Doug Weathers had posted his story with all the pertinent information, beginning with her discovery in the field and ending with her identification. Strangled to death, hands around her neck, yes, definitely, but what else? She'd had a boyfriend he knew, what about her age? Weathers had linked her to to her hometown paper's obituary, which included her age, 27. Jazz broke out in a cold sweat all at once. This just could not be happening. And what about Carla O'Donnelly, college student? She was probably between 18 and 20. He did another search and brought up the news reports from Lindbergh, the results of the police finding her body. She'd been found by a railroad worker near a spur line. The guy had been on a smoke break. He never would have seen the body if not for the fact that he kicked a rock and was surprised by the sound it made when it landed among a tall stand of weeds. A moment later, he peered within, and his life changed. Wait, wait a second, Lindbergh? Wasn't Erickson from there? Hadn't he just transferred from there? Yes, he had. Wonder if he was on the scene there, too but the paper had no names for the police officers on the scene when Carla O'Donnelly's body had been found. It did, however, have information on how she'd been killed. Asphyxiated, the newspaper said, most likely smothered by a plastic bag tied around her neck with a cord. She was 19. Oh, God, Jazz thought, wiping sweat from his upper lip. I can't believe... He tossed a quick look over his shoulder at the photos of his father's victims. They seemed to glare at him. What are you waiting for, they said. Why are you sitting around, they said. Had it just been a couple of days ago that he'd railed against G. William for suffering from linkage blindness? Ha! Jess had had linkage blindness, too, it turned out. The fingers. The fingers threw me off. I thought they were his signature, but they're not. They're something else entirely. He's counting, but he's not just counting. Jazz fumbled for the telephone and dialed G. Williams' cell. He got the sheriff's voicemail. As the message rambled, You've reached Sheriff G. William Tanner. If this is an emergency, hang up and call 911. Otherwise, you know what to do, so get to it already. He ran through what he would say. At the beep, he drew a deep breath. He wanted to blurt out everything he knew, but instead he had to stay calm so that G. William would understand him. G. William, hey, it's Jazz. Calm, cool, rational. Inside, though, his blood thrummed and his soul screamed. I figured it out. There will be more victims. Here's what I know about the next one. Chapter 16 In the crisp light of the autumn morning, Jazz was no longer as certain as he'd been the night before. He double-checked his logic and found no flaws. No flaws except for the fact that his theory was completely insane but maybe G. William would see potential in it. He gulped down a quick breakfast and set up Grandma in her favorite chair in front of the TV. Mornings were her best time, so she was usually okay during the day while he was at school. By three or four in the afternoon, though, she started wavering, which was one reason among many why Jazz was eager for the Crucible to have its debut in a couple of weeks. It was also why he never had, and never could have, an after-school job. He met Howie at the coffee shop, which was more chaotic than usual for the morning rush. On this morning, his best friend was sporting a massive bruise along the left edge of his jaw. It looked like someone had smacked him in the face with a sock full of quarters. 